So let's start with the most fundamental question. What all is an API? API, Application Programming Interface. What is it, what do you hope to learn if you are looking at the documentation for an API? And if you've never looked at one, that's cool. But if you have, here's a chance to show off some knowledge. Anybody dealt with APIs? Sir? How to interact with a service. How to interact with a service. Let's start with that. So Application Programming Interface suggests that it is about programming. It is about an interface. It is a contract, in a sense, between someone who wants to make use of a service and someone who provides that service. Or if you want to say between a caller and a callee. Um, in fact, if you've ever programmed using you know, libraries in Java or Python, the library documentation is basically API documentation, right? It says, for this library function, here's how you call it. Here's what the arguments have to be. Here's the possible return values. Here's uh, the exceptions that might be raised if something goes wrong. So basically, it's a contract saying, if you want to use my service, here's what all you can do. Here's how you do it. And here's what could go wrong and how I'm going to tell you about it. Right? At its most basic, that's what an API is. So if that's what an API is, what are some examples of things that an API ought to talk about? Anybody want to throw one out? What might an API talk about? What might be some things you'd find in API documentation? I'll get you started with one. How do you identify and locate the function to be called? Right? So if I'm going to call a function, OK, well, which function is it? And if there's multiple sets of functions, like are there different classes and you have to figure out which class it's in? Uh, so identifying and locating the function to be called, what's another thing that you might need to specify, sir? Which arguments to provide? How to pass options. And op also, are all the arguments always required? Maybe some arguments are sometimes optional. And if you leave them out, they have some default value that they would take on. So yeah, um, how do you pass? <laughs> what are the arguments, and how do you pass arguments around? Uh, what else? Moving on. It's amazing. You're doing like this in, in like the order that I put them. I'm, I feel so gratified. But yes, how does the caller receive a return value? What does that return value look like? What type does it have, for example? Um, and anything else? Is there, is there a hand up back there? Or is that just shadows? It's hard to tell. Anything else? There's at least one more thing, which I alluded to. If everything goes fine, then this might be enough. But. Yeah, what happens in case of an error? What happens if you ask for something that you, know, you, you didn't include all the required arguments, or something goes wrong while the caller is trying to service whatever you asked to do? Um, how do errors get handled? How do they get reported? Which errors are possible on a particular operation so that you know which ones you might have to handle as the caller? So let's step through these one at a time, because I think we can all agree that if, if the API was for something like you know, a Java library, then how do you identify and locate the function? Well, you just look at the library documentation. It tells you the names of everything. You put that in your code. You hope the compiler finds the library. Um, required and optional arguments? Well, you know how to pass arguments in Java. You just have to know which arguments they are. Um, receive a return value? Java returns things. You just have to know what the type is. And if something goes wrong, well, Java is required to say uh, the following exceptions might be thrown if you call this method. So you should be prepared to handle any of these exceptions. Right? So that's kind of bread and butter how you do it for just a plain old programming language in a library. Our question is, how do these four things translate into the service-oriented architecture paradigm? When what we're doing is using HTTP and routes with URIs to make calls to a remote server, how do we do these four things? That's what this piece of the lecture is about. So how do we identify the callee? The thing that we want, the function we want to call, where is it? Well, it's on some web server somewhere, so obviously we'd have to know the name of the server, right? If we're doing credit card processing, it's probably Stripe. Um, we're going to do a, a couple of examples today on a server called the Movie Database, which is like an open source version of IMDb. Um, so uh, we use the term endpoint to talk about some URI that can receive an HTTP request asking it to call a function. And uh, I'll show you the route, which consists of a base URI, a method, a path, optional required arguments. So all of the argument passing stuff, um, that gets crammed usually into the URI, which I will show you. So taking an example, um, and I'll, we'll go to this real site in a moment, um, there is a API for the movie database that allows you to do things like searching for a movie based on words in the title. And according to their API docs, it says you have to say get 
and the path, the URI that you have to search for has to be slash search slash movie. After that is the parameters. So as a reminder, as a reminder, let's take one, uh, a quick look at the, let me see if I can bring up this slide. There we go. Um, the way that URIs are put together, um, we have, or that routes are put together, we have the HTTP method. Um, we have the protocol that's going to be used. In our case, it's pretty much always going to be either HTTP or HTTPS for secure, which we will learn about later. The name of the host, in other words, the server that we're contacting to ask for the thing. The port number, if it's something other than the standard web port, in most cases, it'll be the standard web port. Um, the path, which in our case is usually going to identify the operation to be done. And after the question mark, basically a set of key value pairs that are the arguments to the function. That's how you think of it. So in this case, the function has a named argument q, whose value is the string cloud in this example. It has a named argument lang, whose value is en in this example. Um, and you could string as many different arguments as you wanted uh, up to a pretty long URL limit. Right? So that's how URIs generally look. And that's what we're going to do to map onto how do you identify the function to be called and the arguments to pass. Because we are now here. Okay, so if we look at the API docs, they'll say, ah, to search for a movie by a string, we'll tell you what the required and optional parameters are, but this is basically the name of the function. What about passing arguments? Um, for get requests, typically they'll be embedded right in the URI, like I just showed. Um, as we'll see, uh, you'll see this in the homework. For post requests, uh, you, there is a way that when you fill out a form on a web page and submit it, all the stuff in the form actually gets passed as part of the request body. But for now, we don't need to worry about that. We're just going to go with the parameters are usually embedded in the, the query portion of the URI. So for example, if we, continuing our previous one, um, if we say get search slash movie and then query equals Coco just means uh, there's a named argument called query and we're going to pass the value Coco in this example. How do we know that the name of the parameter should be query? because we read the API documentation and it will tell us that. Okay, so we're going to actually do a couple of these in just a moment. So suppose we're going to put all this together and say, all right, if we're going to use the curl command line tool to reach out to the uh, moviedatabase.org API and actually do a query and get some information back, what does the entire route look like? So we shall debug it together. OK. That's the verb. Get. And I'll show you the API docs page in a moment, which is where I got this. HTTPS, because according to their docs, all requests have to be made over secure HTTP. What about this? API of the movie db.org slash three. What is going on there? That is, there we go. There's the method. Uh, the base URI, again, this is directly from the API documentation. It basically says all requests to our API have to begin with this. What is the deal with this slash three? It is almost certainly the API version. Because as they evolve their API, if they make changes that would be incompatible with older clients, they usually want to keep the old API around as well so that you don't have to update your client the day that they switch everything over. Okay, so a very standard scheme is that you'll see the base URI and then something that represents the version, like three or v3 or v3.0 or something like that. Um, the operation to be performed, which is we're going to search for a movie and then the arguments, which in this case is just uh, a single argument for query. So the good news is investigating what it means turns out to be pretty simple. And before telling you what it means, I should point out that ever since the idea of, hey, the web can be thought of as a bunch of services, not just a bunch of sites, and let's think about how those services would declare to each other how they wish to be called, right? because that's what an API is, there were a lot of proposals for how that should happen. And there's sort of an acronym soup. You know, you can pick any of these that you want. Um, all of them ultimately ended in what I'll call benign failure. Um, they were either too complex, too heavyweight. They never really got adopted because most developers didn't see the benefit of adopting something complex. It didn't solve a problem that they thought they had. And the thing is, because the internet is not a dictatorship, um, you know, when you ask, well, which standard is going to win if there are competing choices? It's really up to the internet's developers. They sort of decide by voting with their feet. And if a standard is easy for developers to understand and use, well, that certainly works in its favor. Um, if it makes it easy to express the most common use cases, 
but it makes the difficult cases or the rare cases possible to express, right? As opposed to having to do a lot of work just to do a simple common case, that would be good. Um, no licensing. Any standard that is sort of owned by a company and they say, well, to use this standard, you have to get a license from us. These days, that's pretty much dead in the water. And finally, if we're doing services over the web, in a lot of ways, like I said before, the web is different from compilers and libraries, right? You don't get things like compiler errors. Things like, like data types don't really mean the same thing because services can be in different languages and the idea of how you move a structure of data from one language to another. So whatever standard you want to put forward has to sort of match the underlying technology, right? Instead of trying to shoehorn a library-centric view of the world into the web, we need a standard that actually deals with the web on its own terms, even though the web wasn't really designed to do this. Right? Remember where the web came from. It's physicists can post technical papers with graphs, and it's easy to download them. That's what it started from. So everything else really came after the fact. And in this case, the winner is REST, because REST actually gets all these things right. It's easy to use. It's easy to express common cases. Everything about it is open. And it was designed, in some sense, to capture things that were observed to work well in web engineering and sort of fit the standard to that. So what is REST? Uh, REST was actually put forward by Roy Fielding in his PhD thesis. Uh, it now seems like an eternity ago, but that was in 2000. And it stands for Representational State Transfer. Here's what that means. We've already talked about the concept of a route, right? It's an HTTP verb plus a URI that may encode an operation and some parameters. REST goes so far as to say that a route should not be thought of as a thing that names a page or an action. Instead, it should be thought of as a thing that names a resource and an operation. In particular, if an API is RESTful, it should be possible, in fact, it should be easy to answer these three questions about any route. You should be able to say, what is the primary resource being affected by that route? What operation is specifying that should be done on the resource? And you know, maybe it has some side effects. And is there any other data needed to complete that operation? And if so, how do you specify that additional data? So we're going to return to these many, many times. These are sort of like the three REST questions. And by the way, when I say that, I mean, that's my three REST questions. I think I've boiled it down to these three. Um, it's not like some Wikipedia article that says the three REST questions are this. But I think this is a pretty concise way to think about it. And as we'll see, it's a really powerful organizing principle when you are designing your own applications. So a resource can have multiple possible representations. So far, when we've been playing with the movie database, what's been coming back in our responses is these JSON objects that are descriptions of things like movies and lists of matches and stuff like that. But that same application, the movie database, and if you haven't played around with it, I suggest you do. It sort of it feels a lot like IMDb. But it has a graphical interface, too. You can type in search terms. You can like click through a list of matches and get the details for a movie. So the important concept here is the underlying resources are the same. Right? What's happening is that if you access them through a browser with a UI, you are getting a different representation of the resource than if we access them by making direct API calls and getting back JSON data. The underlying resource is the same, which is lists of movies and things like that. In some cases, as we'll see, responses, especially in the JSON case, can include hyperlinks to other resources. So for example, uh, if I can get this movie database page back up, and if you all can see it, um, and if I can, where, sorry, API, there we go. If I can repeat one of the calls we made yesterday, um, you'll notice that some of the things in this response, this is, uh, uh, getting details for a specific movie. A few of the things in the specific response look like they are paths to other downloadable things, right? Some of them uh, actually point off-site, like to the film's homepage. Some of them point to things like the logo of the producing company. Now, this is only a partial path. Like, it doesn't say what server you're supposed to get this from, but if you read the API docs, it will tell you whenever you see a partial path, you should always prepend the following thing to it. So again, it's about reading the docs. Right? But the message there is uh, sometimes the responses might include other discoverable things. So we say that a service is RESTful or an API is RESTful if it basically follows these three principles. If it is the case that for most of the routes operations supported by that API or by that app, you can answer those three questions straightforwardly, then it is probably RESTful. 